Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Origin Stories podcast. I'm your host, Jarrett J. Krasowska. In today's episode, I'll be talking to Andrew Aiden about March, his award-winning trilogy about the civil rights movement. Andrew tells us how he got interested in writing and reading comics and how he convinced Congressman John Lewis that he should tell his story via the medium of comics. Andrew also shares some insights into the writing process and what it was like working with Congressman Lewis. Let's get to know Andrew Aiden's origin story. Origin stories with JJK. Jarrett Krasowski. Like I want to, I want to start at the very beginning. I want to, I want to learn about, you know, what was your boyhood like? What was your home like? What was your family structure? What kind of stuff did you love to read? Like I just want to get into. You know, what were all the ingredients that that came together to give to give us you, man? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, that's, that's really kind, man. Um, this, when you think about March and, and what it's become, uh, it, it's it started on, a, on my couch with my dog and late night conversations between my mom and then calling the congressman. Um, I, you know, where I came into all this, it's... Um, it's funny. I'm in my mother's basement right now. Uh, this is the house my mother built um, and lived in until the day she died. And uh, it's just down the road from the first place I ever read a comic book, which was my grandmother's house. Uh, I'm out here in Western North Carolina, about 45 minutes away from Asheville, a little town called Edneyville. Um, but I, I, I would come up here on summer in the summer. Uh, my mother, you know, um, she needed time to herself. My father left when I was very young. Uh, my father was a Turkish Muslim immigrant, um, and I never really knew him. I mean, he left before I really had too many active memories. And um, so I was raised by my mom. I'm an only child. And uh, I think at first my grandmother was trying to find something to do with me, you know, like this eight, nine year old precocious uh, kid. And so she gave me my uncle's old comic books um, and I would sit and read them. And I think back on like, I mean, he had some amazing comic books. Like the first X Men comic I ever read was actually a first printing of X Men number one. No, <laughs> yeah. wow. Like, and, and I think about it like, Grandma, what are you doing, giving an eight, nine, ten year old kid an X Men number one to just read? You know, <laughs> and you mean your grandmother didn't have it in like a temperature controlled room? <laughs> no, it was in so a fun. cardboard box underneath her desk. Um, <laughs> wow. And, 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 but that's that's what got me hooked, right? And um, I remember it was like this one summer, and uh, I really started reading through all of them. And then I was like, "Grandma, I think I want to buy some comic books." And she said, "Okay, well, we're going to the grocery store, so we'll get some when we go." And we went to Piggly Wiggly, uh, which was a <laughs> grocery store chain Perfect. out here, <laughs> uh, and uh i i picked a x-men comic off of the spinner rack it was uncanny x-men 317 it was the phalanx covenant it had the lenticular cover you know with like that back when they did all this sort of yeah thing. yeah uh, and uh you know i i um I, I think the real answer to your question though like where did all that come from why did it resonate is um when my dad left and and it made so much of my early youth uh, sort of separated into two polar opposites. One is the fact that my mother was incredible. She was always teaching me stuff. We would go on road trips. She would make me work in the yard. And we would, we would, she was such a gardener. And um, so we were always doing things and she was always insisting on me learning. But there was always this part of me that was just really angry to not have a father. Sure. Right? You play baseball and everybody else's dad is the coach. Mm-hmm. And you're like, uh why why does timmy get to play shortstop timmy sucks and you're, <laughs> you know it's like well his dad's the coach learn that lesson early you know yeah um and and i i really found it was like my safety blanket once i got introduced into comics it was like every time something was hard or stressful i would i would start reading comics and, and honestly it wasn't just comics like like I love the toys too, right? Like I was, I was the <laughs> Batman generation, right? Batman yeah. comes out in '89. It's Michael yes. Keaton, and uh, matter of fact, uh, just got my Batmobile. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> great! I wish mine was an arm's reach. 
Um, that's great. Yeah. I, I, I have, so that's the 89 Batmobile. I have that. Uh, I will raise you uh, <laughs> the, I will, I, and I don't have it here. I mean, I see it, but I, I would have to get through all this gear. Uh, Super Friends in the box. Oh, yeah. The Super okay. I I had my original toy, <laughs> but I found this in the basement of the camp I used to work at, and they were just about to throw it away. And I was like, no, I'll take that. Yeah, no, oh, Batman yeah. Batman was it for me. Batman and X-Men were, were both it for me, too. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know if this happened to you, but, uh, you know, it comes to a point where, for me, my grandmother says, you got to get rid of all these toys. And I'm like, we can't get rid of the Batman stuff. No, no, that's <laughs> sacrilege, you know? Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, and that's, that's right. That's, that's, um, those sort of formative experiences is, is why I think, you know, you, as you see this generation that comes up reading March, um, that they are so smart and talented when it comes to organizing, because when, when you learn those things and those things reach you at that age, it's not just something that's like a passing fad. It becomes a part of who you are. Hmm. and that was always you know that was what that was what we were trying to do you know how do you inspire these kids like you you've got to present like this i mean even for me you know i think part of the reason i wanted to go into politics like a big part of it was that i grew up seeing my mom be just treated like a second class citizen because she was a single mother you know this was the south hmm. in the 80s and like she couldn't get a mortgage without her husband's signature, like things that were just very basic, you know, um, that, that now, I mean, we're only starting to reckon with, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, the, the wealth gap between uh, women, people of color. I mean, there was, there were so many systemic barriers and I would see it at six and seven years old. Cause my mom, she never talked to me like I was a little kid. Right. Mm -hmm. I can remember my mom started talking to me about taxes. I'm like seven years old. I'm like, what's a 1040, you know? Um, and it was, it was that that like so that informed so much about just the way I saw the world, you know, because I saw it through her eyes. And uh, now, when you think about like these, these these kids who are who are living through another era like that, where they're they're being bombarded by so much media, right, and mm -hmm. and it's not being dumbed down for them, so they're consuming it, mm -hmm. and. It, I think you're seeing them, them manifest that same sort of uh, righteous indignation. And and I think what March, I hope, does is it gives them that way out. Uh, it gives them, you know, a model for how they can exercise that indignation. When I was writing it, my mother would always say, write it for that angry nine-year-old you once were. Hmm. And, um, you know, I, I think that's... I'll tell you a story. Uh, so I, I never really had that father figure. And um, until I, I, John Lewis, you know, I started his office answering his mail, right? So, and worked my way up. And, and how and, old were you when you started answering the congressman's mail? God, it would have been like 23, I think. Um, I, mean, I was like fresh out of college. I did a stint for the lieutenant governor. I was his floor assistant in the state legislature. And then I did veterans affairs casework for like six months. Um, or a little longer than that. And it was really, really difficult. And I was trying to get closer to my mother because she was, we didn't know what it was, but she was starting to get a little bit sick. We couldn't figure out what it was. I knew I needed to be a day's drive away. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I applied and got a job in the congressman's office answering his mail. Um, but, you know, fast forward through all of that. March has come out. The third book is out. Um, and, and I get invited to go speak at my old high school. And what you got to know is um, my mother insisted on me going to this high school because she thought it would give me opportunities I couldn't go get elsewhere. It was a private high school in Atlanta. Um, you know, I, I don't actually have a lot of negative things to say about the school and the personnel, but parts of the community were just nuts, right? I mean, like obscene wealth and not necessarily treating people the way they should the, the new yorker a guy named charles Batia has written about it several times it was an absurd place right and i was there on a scholarship and so mama and i never really felt like like we belonged you know i mean these kids were going to aspen to ski and i was like mama will you take me to to toys r us so i can see if they have new uh, action figures you know like that was our fun getaway um and so we get invited to come back and the congressman says he'll go with me Right. And this is the same school that rejected Dr. King's kids in the 60s. Wow. 
um, in Atlanta. And so we go, we give this speech. And I'm telling these kids, like, let me tell you something. The the cool kids that you think are cool now are not going to be cool forever. And some of those nerdy kids out there, they're going to be the ones coming up here on stage talking to you when all is said and done. And so I felt like I had my, like, righteous moment. And then, of course, John Lewis, um, who was, like, the most sensitive person to people. Like, people forget that part of it, right? That he was – he understood uh, – the kind of the core of an individual very quickly. And so my mother came with us uh, to see this speech because she thought it was just such a thing. Mm. And it was like, it was like we'd won somehow. And the congressman's giving his speech and he says, you know, first I want everybody to know, uh, I want to, I want to say, you know, Andrew has become like a son to me. Mm. Um, and, and it wasn't the, the only time he said it, but he said it in front of my mother. Um, and, and she's, she's getting a little teary, but then he stops everything and he says, you know, I want us all to acknowledge the person without whom none of us would be here today. And I'm like, who's he going to talk about? And he just, he says, you know, Lynn, would you stand up please? And calls out my mom. And it's like something out of like school ties where like this big fancy auditorium of all these kids in their prep school outfits, they all stand and they're applauding my mother. My mother's sitting with like the headmaster and the director of admissions and all the people who, uh, all the people whose acceptance I think she had, had uh, hoped for and never got when we were in the school. Um, and my mom is just, just, Ryan, her eyes out. Hmm. And so afterwards, the congressman and I and my mom are waiting out front. We're about to get our car and, and drive off. And the congressman says, I'd like to get a picture with you. And so I take this picture with my mom and the congressman. And it was the only time in my life I ever truly felt like I was with my mom and my dad. Hmm. You got your family picture. I got my family picture. Um, and so anyway, I, I think about that, about I never would have had that if my mom, my grandmother, if they hadn't let me explore this this part of me in comics and, and this whole, whole nerd culture that um, I don't think made sense to them at the time, right? Like, you know, we, we, we talk about it with such nostalgia, but like, those of us who were nerds in the 80s and 90s, like we were, there, there was no cool about. Like, yeah, there was no cool superhero movie. There was no, yeah, no, that was, that that was not, uh, yeah, 100%. I mean, it's, it's probably hard for folks that, you know, weren't alive then to comprehend that because these superhero movies are huge blockbusters and everyone's seeing them. But right. back when we were coming up, you know, it was like second class or so third, fourth class citizens <laughs> in the hierarchy of, of a high school and elementary school. And, you know, especially if, if, you know, your mom and grandma didn't grow up with that kind of stuff. I mean, I, I was raised by my grandparents. They did not come up with that kind of stuff, but still like they took me to the comic book store. Cause they, they saw that it, it brought me comfort and, and the same, same with your mom and your grandma. Like they saw, that that was a lifeline for you. And, and so they kept giving you those lifelines. Yeah. And honestly, uh, since the Congressman passed, since my mother passed, since my grandmother passed writing those comics, you know, working for DC and Marvel, mm -hmm. just even their short stories, like maybe an issue here or there, but those have given me that same kind of comfort. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there was a lot of people who, you know, there were a lot of people trying to get me to, to work for another elected official or something like that. You know, they wanted the guy who made good trouble for John Lewis, like who, who did all that. And, yeah. and yeah, I didn't want to do that. I, uh, I came back out to mama's farm and I, you know, drove my tractor and I sit down here with my Batmobile and, and, you know, I mean, and like talk about like an opportunity to deal with your own personal issues. Like one of the things I got to do was a story for DC about Damian Wayne, Batman's son. Mm, um, oh, cool. And I made, I made the case to them that Damien's grandfather is Ra's al Ghul. So Batman's son is half Turkish, just like me. 
And they were like, actually, it checks out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and then we did this whole issue where, like, we had, uh, instead of the Norse gods, I, I used Hittite gods, which are sort of the indigenous gods of the, the Anatolian region in Turkey. And, um, the, like, kind of established that Damien Wayne um, was half Turkish. And also, at the same time, deal with... Um, what that means to be of two different worlds, particularly worlds that uh, don't understand each other. Hmm. Um, and, and it was, a, it was like a cathartic moment for me. It was one of the happiest moments I'd had in a long time to see it come out and get everybody saying nice things about to work with Junie Ba, who's a fantastic artist. Um, and then <laughs> I, uh, my mom, you know, living in mom's house, there's always these reminders of her life. And some of them are good, and some of them you just, like, you know, you see the grumpy old photograph of a relative you never really knew much about, yet she had it up. And <laughs> so I, I had Junie do a portrait of the Bat family with these characters that we created, uh, Tarhun and Araniti, um, and then Damien with Roz and Talia and Batman. Like, this this very weird but, but very Turkish sort of family portrait. And um, I replaced. <laughs> He's that old photograph of that grumpy relative oh, in your house. Everybody <laughs> so comes in, I say, they're like, oh, what is this from? I'm like, oh, it's a family portrait. <laughs> that's hysterical. But I tell you, like, that's that's a really interesting, uh, you know, tidbit of information about creativity is how you can give something so deeply personal of yours to a fictional character. Right. And and. You can process stuff through through fiction as well, because, you know, writing memoir is is really hard. And, and, and some young people, they 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 want and need to process what's happened to them, but they're not yet ready to write about their own lives. So right. whether that's fan fiction of a superhero character or in your case, you know, professional fan fiction, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, does, it, does it feel like professional fan fiction? I mean, it's like. You're, you're getting to actually play with these real characters and have it be canon. But you yeah, still I mean, have your toy Batmobile. <laughs> you know, right? Well, there's, I was trying to explain to um, somebody. They're like, oh, you know, how do you come up with it? And I'm like, well, the first thing I do is like whatever characters are in the story. Like I, I have this big bin of loose action figures that I bought over the years. I mean, some of them going back to when I was like 10 or 12 years old. So I go and I, I pull out the toys and I lay them out in front of me. And like that's where I start coming up with who they are and like remembering like there's something about seeing them physically in front of me helps me keep track of all the characters and like i'm not gonna pretend like i don't pick them up and then like have a little <laughs> conversation where it's like pew pew you know and like andrew i guess andrew I, get, I gotta tell you andrew when i was working on jedi academy i did the exact same thing i had all right? these yeah the yoda and chewbacca toys and um and you know, bl while blasting the John Williams score, and and it's like I this is I get to do this for my job. Uh, that's amazing. That's amazing that you have that collection because I do think though that um, I think uh, I, you know I've been analyzing this too because my studio is filled with childhood toys. Uh, like you, only child. Like you, did know my biological father. Uh, and and not only were these toys comfort, and they were your friends, but. They're also kind of like this was our first storytelling experience, right? Imaginative play, right? I remember my grandmother would say because uh, I I like to do the voices, right? I would give them <laughs> each like their own voice, you know. And, That's awesome. Um, my my grandmother was always talking about like, well, maybe someday you could be a voiceover person, you know? Like just like always trying to think like, am I gonna be able to get a job out of this? Because like. <laughs> He's not doing his homework, uh, so maybe this will make sure that he's not, you know, living on my couch or something. <laughs> that is that is a fear that, as a parent now, I understand of like, you know, you want your kids, like, you want to support your kids so they can follow their north star. At the same time, you have this fear of how are they gonna pay their mortgage or pay rent and buy food? <laughs> yeah, especially because it's getting harder and harder to do that. Yeah, um, yeah. But you know, I mean, I think. I think that's what honestly makes us so lucky, right? And I think is what attracted me to the actual industry of comics because I'll never forget, I, my first comic show was Dragon Con. 
right? And my mother let me go for the first time when I was 12 years old. She sent me down to downtown Atlanta by myself with one of those big brick cell phones, right, for emergencies that cost like $7 a minute to use. And I remember going down there. Oh, and it was in a fanny pack, right? You want to talk about (laughs) (laughs) big, bright, neon yellow fanny pack, man. I was killing it. I was killing it. Oh, no. 12 years old. Um, (laughs) I remember... I remember going to Artist Alley for the first time and you see all these people like just conducting business, right? Like earning money because we were, I mean, we were broke, you know? And then it was like, I used to make money by mowing lawns and mowing lawns in Georgia in the summer is the worst because it's 105 degrees outside, 100% humidity, you're sweating, you're getting bit by bugs. Everything was just awful about it. And I still, still do it. Although now I get this weird, like almost like masochistic joy out of it because it reminds me of those times when, you know. And I remember seeing this commerce happening, like that, Mm. that these artists and these writers were being able to make a living simply from the power of their ideas. And that just lodged itself in my brain for my entire youth from there on, um, that it was, um, possible to not just work a job, but to be an independent individual who is free to live how they want Hmm. because of their ability to create and to dream things up. And I loved that idea so much. I mean, I can't say that I had the courage to pursue it at first, right? I mean, it was very much my mom, my grandmother, my mom, and just being like, yeah, you got to get a job. You need health insurance, right? Yeah. And I think that's part of why I went into politics, because it was both an avenue for having that kind of job, but also being able to, to a certain extent, be creative and also to help people like my mom um, mm-hmm. and, and, and folks like us. And yet I never I remember I took I took John Lewis to Dragon Con multiple times. Um, <laughs> but I remember the first time we went, it was just after. I'd pitched him on March and he'd said, yeah, I'll do it, but only if you write it with me. And I was like, all right, well, you need to know what you're getting into, right? So it was the summer of 2009 and he meets me down there with his son, John Miles, who I'd known since high school and is still like a good friend of mine. And um, he meets me for lunch in the Hyatt, which if you've ever been to Dragon Con, that's like the original, like like that's the OG hotel where everything used to happen. And um, he's sitting down there and he's eating and he's just like, you know, kind of hunched over his plate, but he's like looking around like this, you know, back and forth. And I'm like, I'm like feeling like maybe he's a little apprehensive. I said, you know, I said, sir, is it, you know, what, what do you think? And, and he just says, that young lady is not wearing very many clothes. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh God, he thinks he's all these cosplayers or everything. Yeah, it's just, and they're then, dressed up as a character. It's nothing salacious. Right, <laughs> right. And so... And then I started trying to explore, sir, that's, you know, I think it was like a, um, remember it was like Rogue or something, you know, or, oh, oh, it was the Lilu. That was what got him. Um, And then at the same time, you know, there's like Wolverines coming in. And so he starts asking like, who's the character, right? And then we start playing like, I'm explaining who the character is. Eventually John Miles is like, daddy, that's, you know, that's the Hulk, you know? And, (laughs) And so he starts to get into it. And then we're eating. And then of all people, Jimmy Palmiotti comes up. And he says, Congressman Lewis, it is an honor to meet you. You know, I go to a lot of these, but it's such an honor to meet a real celebrity here and a real hero. And I think it was in that moment, not only was it my childhood meeting my adulthood, because I remember buying uh, Ash comics when he was sitting with Joe Quesada uh, uh, at Dragon Con when I was like 12, right? Mm. So it was my childhood meeting my adulthood. But I think that also helped crystallize to the congressman the this, this sort of intellectual leap we were trying to make in a big picture way, that he did belong at this place because he himself was a real life hero. And what this convention was honoring was heroes and, and our need to experience uh, heroic lives and heroic actions. Um, and, and I think, I think that really played an essential role in those early days and 
and helping him understand what it was we were trying to do. So, so you had a lot, you really had a lot riding on, on, on Congressman Lewis's visit <laughs> to the, that, that, that con. Like he, it could have gone either way. It, he could have been like, I don't know if I want to get into this like underworld of <laughs> cosplay right. and stuff like that. Yeah, no. Well, I mean, it wasn't just that con. I mean, I, I, I staked pretty much my entire political reputation on the idea, right? I was right. so young when we started it. Um, so hold on one sec. So you, I'm assuming you in college, what you were political science? What, what, what did you study? Political science and, and, and film studies. Oh, yeah. and film studies. So film studies, okay. So that, film studies, that is where the, the comic book education is too, though. Oh, yeah, 100%. But they didn't have a comic book program back then you know no of course not of course not so so that makes total sense that you studied film and political science Uh yeah it was documentary film too yeah which is really interesting when you consider that it's like kind of a documentary comic book it's basically what you made and so yeah and and so yeah so you're right so you're you're getting into politics you're working for congressman lewis and you have like this whole other like this is like your Superman Clark Kent. I don't know which way is which of like you're right. in politics on one side and then and then, you know, putting on your fanny pack and going to the comic book convention with your mom's cell phone <laughs> on the other side. Right. And so yeah. so those worlds must have just like like how like were you ever then like outed as a comic book geek to like all the politicians? Uh years later like as march took off yeah i mean it just became like i was that guy i'll never forget going to justice sotomayor's office and i i introduced myself uh and you know with the congressman she goes oh you're john lewis's nerd (laughs) (laughs) yes ma'am you want a copy of the comic i can do that um yeah no that's great also you gotta remember too when we first started doing this it was 2008 so Iron Man was just coming out, right? So it was such like a far-fetched idea at that time that what I started working on at the same time as we started thinking about how to do March and write it is I did my graduate degree at night at Georgetown, right? Because why not kill yourself in your 20s? <laughs> You've got um, the energy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I could never do that again. But so I was working on the Hill, going to grad school at night and working on March. And I used this grad degree program, which was, you know, another public policy program uh, to write my thesis on the history of Martin Luther King and the Montgomery story, the comic that inspired us. Right. And and that thesis became sort of our roadmap. And it was it was essentially trying to convince everybody that this was not such a crazy idea and found that Dr. King, this was such a like, lightning bolt moment when I found the letter with Dr. King's edits to that comic book script. Right. And to be able to be like, well, Dr. King edited a comic book. So all you people laughing can just, you know, sit down. (laughs) Um, But I mean, like I got so much flack from the establishment type staffers and the people around John Lewis who really didn't think he should be doing it. They thought he'd lost his mind. Um, I mean, it 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 got acrimonious in the congressional office because of it. Um, There were a number of people who just really were not good people because of that. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and it was very, there were these dark years of like, you know, um, just having to work on it and try and be as quiet as possible that we were working on it. Because every time we made a peep about it, it got to be such big news. Um, I remember just when we put out the press release saying that we were announcing it and it got picked up everywhere and everyone was shocked that, that, that it got so much coverage. But it was really because we were so shocked that John Lewis was doing this, you right. know, and it sort of fed itself. Um, and so it, it became this tremendous amount of pressure uh, because if it was poor, if it didn't work. Uh, that was the end. I was never going to work in politics again. Mm-hmm. Um, all these people would have been right. Um, but then, of course, it did work. Uh, and and then that 
caused a whole nother thing. But, you know, I mean, I think um, the thing I tell kids all the time is that if you're being laughed at, you're probably doing something right. And and that was my experience, right? If I had let those kids, those, those kids, those adults um, who were making, you know, four, five, six times as much money as I'd ever seen in my life, you know, um, if I'd let their, like, common wisdom deter me, uh, uh, my, I, 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 I would be lost. John Lewis would have been lost. He would have been lost to history. Mm-hmm. Like, people forget that when we started March, John Lewis almost lost his congressional seat because he endorsed Senator Clinton over Senator Obama and that the Obama world came after him in a way that I don't think people fully understand. I mean, they called him everything except for a child of God. He had two primary challengers that ran against him. He was constantly getting called and told it was time for him to retire. And the big question then became, how do we actually teach people the full breadth and depth of what John Lewis had done with his life? Right? Because people did not know. I mean, this is when you had the nine word problem. Only nine words. Uh, it was a Southern Poverty Law Center report that coined the term and said most high school students graduate from high school only knowing nine words about the civil rights movement. Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, I have a dream, and that's it. And so it was like it was like he almost didn't exist in public, right? He had lost his leadership battle. He had he tried to run for leadership in the House and lost badly. Um, it was it was, and I remember him saying to me on that campaign in 2008, where this idea came from. He was so upset and like just frankly depressed. He said, I'm worth more dead than alive. Hmm. Wow. And it really like the reinvention came about because he and I got so close that he trusted me in ways that I don't think he had trusted people before. Um, Certainly not a young staffer. Um, And that, you know, led to this two prong because you got to realize this was working in conjunction with each other. You had March. But you also had the social media that I was running too. And it was like he carved it out. So I didn't report to anybody about this. I reported directly to him and that was it. And so that's where like good trouble came from. Like that started as a hashtag that I was wow. using. when We were putting out um, like I started I was doing the research for March. And so I dig up all these old pictures of him. And then the congressman would look at him and he was like, you need to put those out. And I was like, well, what if we tweet them out and like tell the history? So then we started doing these tweets about like, you know, 52 years ago today, I did this. And then, you know, hashtag good trouble. Right. And you built this phrase around this identity of him as a true real life hero. Right. And that's all building and building. And then March lands and we do this. uh uh, we, we guest edited an, an issue of the local Atlanta um, free paper called Creative Loafing. And it was on the future of nonviolence, right? And so I wrote the article about the, the sort of feature piece about Martin Luther King and the Montgomery story and how that had been used to inspire another generation to join the sit-in movement and other parts of the civil rights movement. But we also had articles in there how about social media could be used to stage mass protests, you know, what the uh, laws are around protesting and organizing and things like that. Like just like a, a a free guide that we gave out to all. I mean, they did like hundreds of thousands of copies in Atlanta the week that March Book One came out to explain to them what we were really trying to do and the full breadth and depth of what March could be used for. And it was, you know, you, you have all of those things converging and all of a sudden, you know, it ends up being he's cosplaying at Comic-Con. He's crowd surfing on Colbert. But all of this was fed by the dramatization of his service uh, and his actions during the movement on social media. And then the use of the March graphic novels in classrooms and in reading programs all over the country. And that brings him to this apex moment at the end of his life. And, and when I look back on it, it was really the only way I could pay him back for the gift that he gave me of treating me like a son. Wow, that's so powerful. Yes. I mean, and and you and you use all of the skills that you had, all of that experience with comics and knowing that world, and all of your experience, you know, with storytelling and 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 politics to to get his story out there because you're so right in that had he not spent this time writing all of these details down, 
uh, it, w- it would it would be lost to history. I mean, there's something so sad when 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 we lose our elders, and there's their stories aren't preserved in in some way, and and yeah. what a monumental and important part of American history that we we simply weren't taught as kids, and the, you know a lot of people are wanting to ban books so that it's not tea taught to kids now, which is like this whole, that could be a whole other two hour podcast about that ridiculousness. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, and to that point, you know, I feel like a lot of the reason they're passing the legislation the way they are, rather than doing direct bans is because they don't want the backlash that will come. If you actually address March that way. I mean, look what happened when hmm. uh, then president Trump tweeted about, you know, the crime infested Atlanta district. When he walked in on his first day after inauguration to the white house, White House mailroom was filled with thousands of copies of March that people had mailed in from all across the country. Wow. Right. And that wow. is the way he walked into his presidency. So imagine what would happen if they tried to ban March on a statewide level. So instead, what they're doing is they're passing this legislation that is sort of vaguely worded, but allows for the lawsuits, allows for lawsuits or prosecution of teachers who, who, who teach this undesirable or controversial content. And it's trying to create a, a climate of fear mm. to prevent people um, from uh, using March and other books in their classrooms. And I think what uh, I think in, in a real way, this is all a direct backlash to the success of March, because you go from the nine word problem in 2013 to by 2016, March is the second most widely taught graphic novel in America. Right. And, and and to have it happen that fast and work that successfully, um, that was a real threat because I, I, you know, the congressman would talk about it, that he believed what happened in the spring of 2020 was what he called the March generation seizing their power. Right. And it's mm. no coincidence that the mayor of Washington, D.C. writes Black Lives Matter uh, uh, down the street in front of the White House in the exact same way that. Nate wrote March down the cover of March book three wow. showing highway 80 in Selma. Right. I mean, it's, it's art uh, leading history. It's, it's history imitating art. Right. And, you know, for him to see that at the end of his life, as we, as we talked about it, he saw all of that as a direct manifestation of our work. So this, this whole push about this legislation, they're trying to, undo this uh, tectonic shift that March, that John Lewis, uh, that our work created in education. Um, And I think, you know, the hardest part for them is that John Lewis and I never approached it as a political issue. It was not as if we were trying to force political issues into their mind. It was that we were simply trying to tell the history and then to show the tools and the tactics that young people could use to seize their power in the same way that John Lewis and his colleagues as members of of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee or as members of SCLC or the Congress of Racial Equality or the uh, or COFO during the Mississippi Freedom Summer, the same way they did back then and leave it up to them what issues it is they're fighting for today, but based in the fundamental idea that is inherently American, which is that all people are created equal. Yes. But that's what we're up against now, right? I mean, that is yeah. that is the natural progression. You have a great victory and then you have the backlash. That's why we had to do run because people yes. saw the Voting Rights Act as this great victory, but they forget the Klan starts marching literally days after using those same tactics, right? So uh, his, in my mind, history doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but it certainly rhymes. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. And and I think, too, you know, a common, I would say a common misconception that that I hear from I hear this from other authors. I hear this uh, from friends or, or or just from people in, in social media of, well, how lucky are you, Jarrett, to have Hey Kiddo banned here and there because like you get so much attention for your book. It's like, look, that's not how I want to get attention for my book. You know, right. um, sure. Like, yeah, like it's it's in the news, but you know, it doesn't necessarily mean like it's portraying it in a fair way. You know, there was a, there was a local news affiliate uh, in, in Iowa that, you know, talked about, 
you know, the curse words that I use in Hey Kiddo because it's my grandparents cursed a lot because I was surrounded by addiction. But their B-roll was all librarian shelving picture books. <laughs> it's like, no, like that is not, <laughs> this is not a children's book, man. This is not a children's book. Yeah. But also, you know, what it does, it, it, it deprives information it deprives intellectual property and uh you know if you're if you're a kid out there living the experience depicted in these books you know the books that we've written the books of our colleagues you know that's just there's an adult out there in their community standing up and saying your life is inappropriate and should right. not be seen you know i remember having conversations about your book um when i was on the jury for the LA Times Book Prize. Mm -hmm. And I was in the young adult literature because that's sort of where everyone had put March. And I remember having this conversation about the curse words and things like that and, and telling this story about myself when I was like 10, 12 years old. My mom gave me the client to read and it was it was fantastic. It was stop talking down to me just because I'm young. I can read these things. I can grasp these. I can wrestle with these difficult concepts. In some ways, it was liberating because when they put you in this padded space where they don't let you understand or see the complexities of life and these things that are deemed by like uber i don't know the the, the folks who, who who want the children to only know certain things um you as a child feel that absence yeah and you need that literature that goes to those places to help you understand what these things are that you can feel but can't see yet. Like you know there's more to life. You know there's more happening in front of you. And it makes you sad and it makes you scared and it makes you insecure when you don't have the ability to understand and process those things. When it's just a vague sense that there's things you don't know or can't see that people don't want you to know. But when you give those things as you do in Hey Kiddo, and talk about addiction and talk about it, what it is to have a family that um, doesn't conform mm -hmm. to Mayberry or to, <laughs> you know, whatever people's yeah. perception of the, the decade is of, of the iconic American family. Um, it, it was incredibly important to me that, that the book be recognized that way because um, I, again, I didn't have books growing up to help me deal with being that angry nine-year-old who was mad his father left. I mean, my father was abusive. My father was, uh, I was, uh, in many ways, my mother was, was right to make sure that he was not in my life. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't have literature to help me process that and understand it. And that results in anxiety and depression and anger and all these things. And there's countless children out there young people who are going through those same sort of things. And when we try and put them in this box, when we try and hide books like yours from them, we are not just doing them a disservice. We are actively hurting them. And you're taking, so, you're taking away their lifelines. You're, you're, yeah. you're, and, and, and because I'm sure you felt as I did, like I'm the only kid in my town that's dealing with this. I'm the only kid in America that's dealing right. with this. I am so alone in, in this plight. But and you're not. no, no, and books help us feel less alone. I mean, quite literally, um, feel, make you feel less alone because you think, "Oh, I'm not the only person dealing with this." And and you know, with with graphic novels too, because they're they're visual, you can sort of feel like you're you're in the room where it's happening, right? You kind of feel like you're you're going into the spaces where these real people existed. And because of that immediacy is probably also where there's the fear of adults wanting to shelter kids from more difficult truths uh, because they don't actually they might not actually read the books. They just open a few pictures and say, oh, I don't I don't like that. <laughs> so therefore, I'm not going to take it in context of the entire entire piece. Um, I want to know. Also... Bit... Oh, go ahead. Go go ahead. ahead. <laughs> no, you go ahead. Because I was about to, well, about also... to go. This is part of comics where it's like we're damned if we do damned if we don't. Right. Because on the one hand, they want to say, oh, the comics, they're not serious literature. On the other hand, they want to say, oh, you know, it's too graphic. It's too dangerous to show them. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and I, I, I the, the mental gymnastic that it takes for some of these people to, to go through to, yeah. to try and justify why they don't want young people to read it is is amazing to me because it's so deeply steeped in hypocrisy and nonlinear logic that 
you know, we have an obligation as creators to call it out, to fight back. And I think, you know, I, I hope as this, because I don't think this CRT fight or whatever the, the version of it at the moment becomes, I don't think it's going away. No. I, I think this is uh, one of those um, hallmarks of a society that is moving in an authoritarian direction. And this is our way of fighting back against that authoritarianism um, by by waging this war in the libraries and in the schools. Like we have an obligation to continue making books, telling these stories, but also speaking up and speaking out, as the congressman would say. Well, and 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 on that too, through through the work you did with Congressman Lewis, he, you know, beyond the grave, he's still creating good trouble. Like he's still fighting the fight that he he spent his entire life and being working towards, right? Well, I mean, when you think about how many, how many millions of young people he reached through March and, and continues to reach every year in classrooms, in schools, in libraries, all of the, these, these young people are taking his lessons and applying them to the problems in front of them. And that's why you see things happen like in the spring of 2020 uh, with the protests uh, over George Floyd and other murders. Um, and it's, it's, it's why we have to do everything in our power to ensure that these books continue to be taught and continue to have places in libraries and find new homes. Um, the congressman would often say that if every young person in America had the opportunity to read March, America would be a better place. It would be yeah. a different place. Um, and I think, you know, it all goes back to this moment that happened um, right when book one came out. And I got a phone call from a reporter uh, the Wall Street Journal, uh, and his he said, you know, I got an advanced copy of your book, uh, and I and I loved it. But the reason I'm calling is because you know I don't usually do this, but I gave your book to my nine year old son, and I wanted you to know that he read it, and then he went and put on his Sunday suit, and now he's marching around my house demanding equality for everyone. Wow, wow! As his idea, like imagine if we could create that consciousness in every nine year old in America, this nation would be able to solve many of its problems in a more peaceful way and in a more equitable way. And I think um, that has to be our goal. Well, I, I mean, just the thought of you sticking your neck out there to, to, to even put this in front of John Lewis to say, what if we told your story as a comic book? And then for him also taking that big risk to say, yeah, let's do this. You know, and also, you know, when you talk about the timeline of when you were working on March, you know, the major publishers uh, still didn't really have a true place for graphic novels yet. Like they were getting there uh, with, you know, Jin Yang's American Born Chinese and um, Reina was starting to come on the scene. And we're, and, and of course, Jean was the first graphic novel to uh, American Born Chinese was the first graphic novel to receive a National Book Award finalist sticker, which paved the way for, for March Book 3 to win the gold, like the first graphic novel to win a National Book Award. Um, and that's all stuff you couldn't have foreseen then, but you were listening to your gut, right? You were listening to your gut, you were listening to your lived experiences, uh, and you, you, you can't make your life decisions based on trends. You have right. to make the trends. You have to be a part of that whatever next wave. Um, and Ooh, I think when you talk to kids, you know, the way I like to, to talk to them about it is that they see the future, right? They mm. understand where we're going far better than we do mm. because it's their lived experiences that will create that situation, right? right? Like Gene and I are just a few years apart. You and I are just a few years apart. We all grew up in that 80s, 90s comic book environment. And I remember, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to who were like, I told my mom or I told my dad they should have bought Marvel stock back in 1988 or whatever it was when 98, when it was like it bankrupt. bankrupt. Yeah. Yeah. And they were like, ah, oh, you should do that. And all the parents said, no, 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 uh, that's dumb. You're going to lose all your money. And then, of course, you know, it goes on to be bought by Disney and, you know, turns out to be fantastically profitable. But that in a <laughs> microcosm is, is why I think it, John Lewis, through his whole life, spent so much of his time speaking to young people, going to school, speaking to students, 
because they helped him understand where our society was going and how he mm. could help them get there. You know, I mean, this is a guy who opposed the Defense of Marriage Act in 1992. Yeah. Right? Bef- long before wow. any of these elected officials uh, uh, were willing to speak out publicly to support members of the LGBTQ plus community. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and he yeah. knew, I mean, his experience with Byron Rustin, his experience with members of the civil rights movement, uh, the, 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 I mean, he struggled op- with the openly homophobic nature of uh, some of the uh, leaders of the civil rights movement and, and how they treated Bayard Rustin. Um, and, and I think it's that connection that young people have to the future. And it's fleeting, right? Like, we're yeah. too old now. We don't know what's happening. It's, I think it's sort of why we feel untethered in our 30s and 40s, because it's like we used to understand where the world is going. And now we're beholden to this generation behind us. And we're just trying to figure out, you know, what they know sometimes. But um, I think that's also why I get so much joy out of going and speaking to students. Um, And and also, I mean, this is a whole nother issue, but I, I, March opened this door for me to go speak to incarcerated youth. Hmm. And I do it as often as I can. I've been all over the country. I've been to Cook County. I've been to San Mateo. I've been to uh, Rappahannock. I've been to Alexandria. DC city jail, even I went with John Lewis. Um, and I think about how close I was to being one of those young people by virtue of simply not Mm. being wealthy Mm. by virtue of, um, having a single mother, um, one bad day. That's all it takes. Yeah. And so I, I really feel an obligation to go spend time with them um, in the same way that John Lewis did. Because, um, you know, if we don't, if we don't give our time, we let these young people feel like no one cares about them. It's so much harder for them to, to rebuild their lives. Hmm. And I think those of us, you, me, a lot of us who who can get our books into those facilities and give them that little bit of hope, we have an obligation to show them that the world doesn't care if you are incarcerated, if you come out a great writer. In some ways, yeah. it's an advantage. I, and, I tell you, I tell you too, it's so powerful because... Those those kids don't feel seen whatsoever. I I, rem, I I've been able to to visit a lot of facilities as well, you know, pre pandemic, and I'll never forget, you know, putting my hand out for a handshake, and the kid just not one not knowing if he was allowed, like he looked to the guard right. to say, "Can I?" Right. But then also, not having been given that form of respect, like maybe ever, I I don't know. I mean, it's just. Mm-hmm. It really hit me, right? Because, yeah, like one bad day, one person, you know, that just wasn't there for you. You know, you, you had your grandma and your mom. I had my grandparents. Like, we're, we're lucky to have those people. Uh, but it was just, you know, the, whatever reason those kids are there, the set of circumstances that were beyond their control when they're that young. Right. And I don't know. I um like maybe you experience this, maybe you don't, I don't know. But I, I grew up with such a sense of um, like that, that all of these things that have happened to me in my life were, were so unachievable mm. that every day I wake up having to remind myself um, what nine, 10, 12 year old me would think if I was able to go back and tell them, Hey, this is what your life's going to be like. I think one thing that nine year old you would say, were like, Bruce Wayne had a kid. <laughs> the kid became Robin. What? <laughs> hey, wait, I, that's cool that you get to grow up and write for Batman. But wait, wait what is this? Batman had a kid. <laughs> right. You know, what's funny is uh, in that Batman story, my mom made me this Batman cake for one of my birthdays. And I had this photograph of it. Mommy used to keep it up when I was a kid. And so I put the dang cake in the story. I mean, the story uh. is happy birthday, Damien. <laughs> <laughs> 
you know and then it's also bittersweet because you're like mama i wish you could see this yes you know? of course of course no i totally get that i totally get that well there's no doubt you're making her proud